Hi there, local citizens. It's Florence Adu, your host for the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. I'm back this week with another interesting episode. I have a wonderful old friend of mine who is a writer. She's an editor. She's a consultant with a particular expertise in beauty, which is something that I think so many of us, because we've been locked down, haven't really put a lot of thought into because we're just being pretty for ourselves and maybe for the Zoom camera. But I think it's still something that's going to always be relevant. And to her credit, she has contributed to Glamour, Essence, Marie Claire, Vogue, and she wrote the cover article for the latest issue of Allure magazine. So I want to say welcome to Baze and Pinja. Hi, Baze. Thank you. Hey, Florence. Thank you so much. This is so exciting to reconnect with you this way. I'm loving this. I know. Yay, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, Baze, let's get started. Tell us more about where you're from, where you're local, and what is your craft? Okay. My parents immigrated to the United States from Congo, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the 70s. And I was actually born in New Hampshire, which is very random. And when I was a baby, my parents moved to Washington State. And we kind of moved around a lot in my childhood. So from there, we also lived in Oregon for a long time. And then we moved to Arizona, the suburbs of Phoenix. So I would say that's really home. I'm making air quotes because that's where my parents still live. I went to, I got there in time for eighth grade, went to high school there. Fun fact, my high school was called Cactus High School (laughs) in Arizona, which I think is just hilarious because it's just the most generic name for for a high school in Arizona you could think of. And I went to Arizona State University, not really my first choice, but you know, I'm the oldest child. So I was the first daughter going to college and my parents were not feeling the idea of private school. That just wasn't in their (laughs) mentality when we had a school with a great business program in state. So I did that. And right after I graduated, I left and moved to New York City. Right. You had a West. (laughs) <laughs> like yeah, I had enough I, of this desert. Yeah, I mean, I remember liking the Northwest, which was when I was a young child. I think we had a good time there as a family. The move to Arizona was about my dad's job. And I never really felt like it was the best place for us for various reasons. And so, you know, it was just where we lived, you know, you know how that goes. And when it was time for me to choose what I wanted, you know, like what fit me, it was not Arizona and it wasn't even the West. You know, I wasn't interested in going to California like a lot of my schoolmates did or even Nevada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where in Arizona were you? My parents live in a town called Peoria, Arizona. A lot of people don't know there's another Peoria in the U.S. and it's in Arizona, which is it's really just a suburb of Phoenix. So it's northwest of Phoenix. I would say it's about a 45, 40 minute drive from the Phoenix airport. Okay, I'm somewhat familiar with Phoenix, the Phoenix area. I have a very good girlfriend who moved there and met her husband there. So she started her family there. So I would go Mm -hmm. and visit. It's an interesting place culturally as well when you kind of look at it in terms of the influences from Native peoples and then Central American peoples. And obviously there's the, you know, white American influence. And then there's an immigrant community that is in Phoenix. So, And it's an immigrant community that is not just African, but it's Persian. Like she had Persian friends. She had like all this, like this basket of different friends that Mm -hmm. were there. So did you find any diversity in your town where you were? When I was growing up, I don't feel like it was very diverse, not where we lived. So where we lived, my high school was mostly white and I was often one of the only Black students in my class, if not the only one. And it was a very large high school. The high school had about 2,000 people. In our family life, my parents found an African community. And so their social life, you know how it is as a kid, you get dragged to the 
the family yeah. friend <laughs> gatherings and the kids all have to sit in a room and just get along and hang out while the parents are doing whatever. And I remember one of the things I loved about that was that we could drink as much soda as we wanted. And I felt like that, <laughs> was, not the first. <laughs> that was always one of my favorite things about those gatherings because nobody right. would care. You know, this yeah, is, I grew up in a time true. where nobody cared about kids when I was growing up. I feel like these kids today that are constantly entertained and have all these activities, people did not care that we were bored. Like that that's is how, so they did true. not care. Yeah, and so that is so true. Yeah. And I kind of love that style of parenting, to be honest. But so we had that going on. And so I knew other African children, you know, like me, who were first generation American through my parents' social circle. Gradually that tapered off, you know, things just change, people move, friendships change, stuff like that. But that was such a big part of growing up. I remember doing a lot of that and also us having people over as well. Those kids, though, all lived in different areas. So okay. they, so they, they went to, no, they went to different schools. And this is before, you know, texting and cell phones and social yeah. media. So we really were just seeing each other in person during those gatherings. And because that spans several years, you do get to know people. And I'll always remember a lot of those other kids. And even now, sometimes on Facebook, we find each other or we follow each other. They're always going to be part of my childhood memories. I don't feel like I was able to form the connections that maybe I would have with the tools that we have now. So Mm -hmm. I think that would have been interesting to see how that changed. But in my school, in my immediate life, there wasn't a lot of diversity. And I would say the majority of people of color I was around growing up were Mexican. You know, there's a huge Mexican population Uh all over Arizona, and they were more of the dominant group of people of color. In terms of culture, you're absolutely right. I think that as much as difficult as it was being a young Black girl in Arizona in the 80s and 90s and beyond, there's some amazing things about it. It's such a beautiful state. You know, it's really, really gorgeous. You know, Sedona is one of my favorite places. Yeah. If if you've never visited, I just think it's such a beautiful, beautiful place. And you're right about the Native American influence going on. And there's places where you can go and buy beautiful jewelry, like beautiful turquoise and handmade things that are connected to indigenous people. And it just looks pretty. You know, there's just even just driving through regular neighborhoods. It's really beautiful. And there's times when I'm like, I really wish I liked it here. (laughs) Because (laughs) because it's such an easy place to live as well. Not the heat. The heat is not easy to deal with even now. But In terms of the people and the boredom, I'll be honest, it's always been hard for me to imagine moving back. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. So tell me more about how your parents made it to the U.S. So my parents came for education. I'm assuming that was also the case for your parents. So tell us more about your parents' story of deciding to leave and to be here. Mm -hmm. Well, my father, he's very, very smart. I'm not just saying that because it's my dad. (laughs) He had a reputation for being exceptionally bright all throughout his schooling in Congo. And he became a professor. So he's a math, math guy. Math was his subject. And he became a professor at the University of Kinshasa. Okay. And somehow he got into a international program at Georgetown. And so he was able to come to the U.S. to do this program. And before that happened, he had met my mother and they had plans to marry, but they didn't get married because he was going to go and do this program. And if they got married, it would mean that she had to go to his village and live with his family. Right. Okay. So he was like, I actually have been talking with my mom a lot about the past. And she was telling me that he was like, if you go and live with my family, you and my sisters will fight constantly. And I'm not going to do that to you. (laughs) He has a bunch of sisters. And so they didn't get married. So she could stay home with her family. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then the plan was he would bring her to the US. And she has these funny stories about how the women in the village were like, girl, you know, he's not going to come get you right you know <laughs> and just being really negative about it but it happened yeah, he yeah. Sent for her and so she joined him and she's very nonchalant about it like to me I'm like this has to have been a terrifying experience you know like you're a young woman she was like maybe 22 23 let's say mm-hmm. flying to the United States alone mm-hmm to meet your new husband who you don't know that well. Mm -hmm. And she just had all this confidence and she made that trip. And yeah, it was difficult. You know, it was a difficult adjustment, but 
that's how she got to the States to join my dad. And they did think they were coming back, like I'm sure a lot of people do. And here they are still here. So yeah. Your dad was a very smart man. (laughs) He loved your mom because, yeah, he was very that foresight to know that I want the woman that I love to not have this hardship to be with my family. That's very, uh, yeah, you know, those those traditions. And so, yes, I think also, you know, I've talked with him over the years about it. I think he did see the writing on the wall, too, in terms of a war coming at some point, like Mm -hmm. once they were here and Mm -hmm. started having kids, I think at some point, the idea of going back faded and faded away because that sensing that trouble ahead. Right. And so I think that absolutely had a lot to do with why they ended up staying and the reality of where you put down roots. It's very hard to break out of that. And to be honest, that's informed my choice to move to New York. I don't think I really knew it at the time. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm older, I can see that on some level, I think I knew that because basically, after college, I just upped and moved. I didn't have a job. Okay. And I knew two people in New York City. But I knew that if I did what a lot of my peers were doing and just, you know, took a job in California or something, knowing I wanted to live in New York, it'd be very hard to get myself to New York if I started a a life somewhere else. And so I decided to just like go, you know, while I had nothing and I was still in that college mentality of sure. (laughs) <laughs> not, <laughs> I'm just going. Not, yeah, not needing much and used to being broke and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, right. I'm glad I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that just about our mothers, because my mother was pretty much in the same situation. My dad was in a program. He moved and they actually did get married because our tradition is not the same. So she was home. But she had siblings that had traveled to abroad. So she had already had in her mind, I'm leaving this place no matter what. Like, I just know that there's something else. But it was still daunting to do that, you know, hours long, half a day journey from Ghana to New York, land by yourself and just be in a whole nother world and then just kept it moving. So, yeah, kudos to our mothers because they... Yeah, and, you they know, were... my, my mom, she only spoke Swahili, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, she did yes. not speak any English. Wow. So, so speaking of, do you speak Swahili? I've lost the little bit of Swahili that I used to be able to speak. I think my parents still thinking at some point they were going to move back. Mm-hmm. didn't. And I think also one, I think in the time period, this was a time period where I think assimilation was more it, the expectation and front and center. Yes. It wasn't a time where it was cool to have a strange name or speak languages and eat weird food and all of that. And so, you know, I don't know if my parents were absorbing that from the culture, but I would say for black Americans, even at that time, assimilation was the name of the game. So mm-hmm. they didn't speak to us in Swahili or French growing up. They spoke to each other in those languages. And I think also they didn't have an example of how to raise kids in another culture. I think they took things for granted. When you're growing up in the culture, you're just soaking it up, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think they just didn't quite, because they didn't have siblings, you know, they didn't have other family Mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they even realized that if they didn't do it, what the consequences would be. And then it just got to a point where it's harder to kind of, you know, force that. But I did grow up speaking more French. I took French in school and we spoke it like at family gatherings because, you know, it's such a unifying language amongst Africans from different countries. So I did have that. I've lost a lot of it. You know, it's just so hard to retain when you're not speaking it. Yeah. On a regular basis. But when I've gone to Congo, I feel like I can, I'm always like, if I could just stay a few more weeks, I'd have a much, you know, I start you know, throwing you in it. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. But it's, I would say it's like, if I had a wish, it would be that I was fluent in both those languages, Swahili and French. I love Swahili. I think it's such a beautiful language too. So I love hearing it. I wish I could speak it. Wow. Yeah. Well, someday wishes can come true. So it's not, <laughs> it's not too late. Yeah. yeah, it's never too late. And I have our stories in that time are just so very similar because I think mm-hmm. my parents thought the same. They didn't want 
us to feel like we were outside of, you know, aside from being home and eating our, like our food was very much our food from Ghana, mm-hmm. With, mm-hmm. you know, with the tantrums every now and then that we threw because we wanted to have hamburgers mm-hmm. and pizza mm-hmm. and those types of things. But, you know, that I feel blessed that we actually do have our food because I've met other immigrant children who just, they don't even have their food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like their families went all in, like we're American, we're going to do this American thing. So, and you've made a great point is that they just didn't know how to raise a family in a different culture. And that's like a light bulb moment because that's exactly what it was then. It was either you're part of us or you're not. And I think the luxury that more people have nowadays is that their cultures can be celebrated and taken with them everywhere. Like Mm -hmm. that's the, the lesson of the millennium. Mm -hmm. millennium. Yeah. And I can appreciate that now, you know, as a grown Mm -hmm. woman, I don't, you know, obviously didn't think about it that way growing up. I had a lot of shame, you know, Mm -hmm. about my background growing Mm -hmm. up. And again, I didn't really have anyone to kind of process it with because it's not an experience that my parents went through. A lot of the things I went through were very foreign to them you know, in terms of what goes on at school, you know, Mm -hmm. and the social structures at school and and all of that. But yeah, I remember from a young age being embarrassed about my hair. You know, my mom, when I was a a young girl, she was still threading my hair. Mm. Um, So she was doing these threaded styles. And she did this for me and my sisters. So I would go to school with these threaded hairstyles. You know, she would do all the individual strands with the thread and then kind of connect it. Yes. I would say it would look, maybe it would look like an African version of French braids. You know what I yes. mean? You would then tie each half together. Yes. And I would go to school and I remember I have a memory. I think I was in second grade and I had a, one of my teachers. I would say all my teachers were white, I think, until mm-hmm. college. But, mm. you know, she being an adult was like, loved it. She was like, oh, let me see your hair. This is so beautiful. And she's seeing kind of like this in-person piece of African culture that she wouldn't have exposure to, you know, right. as a teacher in Oregon. But that made me feel embarrassed. You know, one, I was kind of shy, but that t- attention and basically she was just calling out that I was completely different than everybody else. Right. Yeah. I can yeah. see through her adult eyes that she's like, this is dope. <laughs> but then I was just, it was embarrassing to me. And sure. uh, I didn't yeah. understand, you know, that yeah. this was something beautiful to her and why it was just a hairstyle nobody had. You know, so I remember stuff like that. And now I think it would be a completely different experience for young me. Which talks a lot about the power of media and the mediums and kind of, you know, segue into our conversation more about your work and how you came to be this writer and editor and consultant in the beauty space. But before we move into that, I want to understand your local speech. So I asked my guests to share a word, phrase, or saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience and why or how you came to value this as local speak. Hmm. So that means Brooklyn? It could be Brooklyn, but it can be any. So so sometimes you're local where you feel more local is where your heart is more local. So it could be Brooklyn, but it could be somewhere else. So. Hmm. I hear a lot out of my window, Florence. Okay. <laughs> here, here in Bed- <laughs> yeah. I'll give you two. One that comes to mind is the 38. I live across the street from the B38 bus stop, which is a bus in Brooklyn. And mm-hmm. because this bus takes you all through Brooklyn, basically, and it's really convenient, I think of it a lot in terms of where I live. It's such a big part of whether it's because people are always there or me, myself, using it to get around and stuff like that. And you know how people refer to the buses here? They don't really say the full proper name of the bus. It's the something. So I think the 38 feels very much local, local. Oh, nice. A word that I learned later in life that I really enjoyed learning was Mzungu. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> Which means white people. And I don't know why that tickles me so much, but there was something about learning that there was this word that is kind of used to refer to white people that I find funny. And I just like the way that it sounds. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people know that word. And it's, it's, yeah. And it can be something kind of private, like a private joke. I, I hear you. I think, <laughs> you can I, mean, I think that most African and African languages have their white people word. So ours is Obroni. And so, yes, we. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. But yeah. I, just, yeah. I think that 
when you grow up in the States, everything is white centered, European centered. And so we are the ones that are always referred to, you know, in this Mm -hmm. monolithic group way. And so I I think I enjoy having this other side of that perspective, because to me, that word and words like that, that's when the dominant view is us, you know, Mm -hmm. and so it's something about it that I enjoy that. Right. I hear you. (laughs) High five for that one. (laughs) Okay, so so now I want to ask my why the word question. So we know that you grew up partially in the East and in the West, and then you decided, I'm leaving this place. So let's hear a bit more about how exactly you came to be living, working, and playing in New York. You knew you wanted to go. How did you choose New York? How did you happen to be where you are? Mm-hmm. So when I was in college, I was pretty involved in different organizations. And I think one of the organizations I was in was the Black and African Coalition. And we had this advisor, the student advisor, who I think he was from the Southeast. And so he just had a very different, he might have even went to an HBCU, I can't remember, but he had a very different experience than we were having at Arizona State University. And he knew about this leadership conference that took place I believe it was in Virginia. And he just boldly applied for our group to go. And I don't remember now how all that works, but we got the funding. And so he took a group of us. So I think he maybe he took everyone that was in like a an office, like an elected position in the group to go to this conference in Virginia. And so everybody at the conference is from the East Coast. Yeah. (laughs) Like nobody is coming from the West, let alone from Arizona. So kudos to him for being like, whatevs, we're going to go. Yeah. So these students and the whole vibe, it was so different, so different. And I was like, this feels so much more like me, this East Coast vibe that I'm feeling and this attitude and something about these students. It just felt a lot more comfortable to me. And we went to that conference again. So we went two years in a row. Maybe that was like my junior, senior year or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, I think I want to be on the East Coast. You know, I think that's where I want to be. Also, during college, I felt like I wanted to work in the music industry. I worked at a radio station in college and I had some internships that were called college rep positions for record labels. And that's basically Mm -hmm. your a liaison between your college campus and record labels. So you help them promote certain bands, bands that they wanted to market toward the college crowd. This is a very outdated idea now, but there was this college genre. And I really wanted to work in the music industry. I did not want to move to LA. It just wasn't appealing to me. And the music industry in LA was, it was a different focus. So... I knew one person who had family in New York and my last roommate that I had in college, her sister was in New York. So I moved to New York knowing those two people only. And I just saw the writing on the wall. It just felt like if I don't do it, I'll lose my nerve or it will just be very difficult to figure out how to get there if I don't just move. Yes. And so I just did it. And my parents were like shocked and like not really pleased. And like a lot of people were discouraging me, you know, just like it's so expensive and it's dangerous and, you know, all these things. That's why I think you should just go for things when you're young because, you know, ignorance is bliss. (laughs) Yes. Indeed. You really don't know that what you're doing is crazy. You really don't. And so I'm glad I did that. I got jobs, you know, like I got a retail job. I got a a job as an HR assistant. It took me a year and a half to actually get a job at a record label, but I did. Mm -hmm. I got a job at Atlantic Records and it was awful. So this Mm -hmm. was my, my big dream that I was working toward. And it was a complete nightmare. I had a really, really difficult boss and it was just a horrible situation. And long story short, I quit that job after a few months and I got a temp job at another record label. And then shortly after that, I got a full-time job working at L'Oreal. And beauty is not something I had any exposure to. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, growing up when you don't grow up like on the coast, there's a lot of industries that you just don't realize exist. Again, pre-social media. Yeah, I'm sure it's very different now. But I was just looking for jobs. And I sent my resume to L'Oreal. It was for the long comb division. And I ended up getting this job. And it was an interactive marketing. I was an assistant. I ended up working there for about four years. During that time, so you know, I get there and I see these incredibly polished women. And when you work at these big beauty companies... 
on the higher levels, these women have moved around the world to rise up in the company. So, you know, they might have been like a vice president in the South America region, or they're from Ireland or something. And they seeing these women that I, I was just so in awe of, you know, they were really, really educated, very worldly. They were executives. They looked amazing. I mean, it was just a whole new world. And I grew up as a very girly girl. I don't know what happened to that, but I grew up as a very girly girl. So beauty, you know, beauty was fun. And I was getting all these free products and that's pretty yeah. fun all day. So that's how I got into beauty. During that time, I met a woman who used to work at a magazine. She used to be a beauty director. And again, didn't ever understand, you know, the jobs that exist in the magazine world. But talking to her and getting to know her, I realized, because I was in a marketing department, even though my undergrad degree is in marketing, it's not the best fit, you know, the numbers and the sales and all that. Getting to know her it kind of opened my eyes. Like, I think I would like that more to have a more writing and creative focused job. And this is a time where there were still startup magazines and just a lot of opportunity in general. I mean, I'm sure you can relate to that. It's like, just looking back, you could just move around, I think a lot more easily. There was just more opportunity, but I pursued a job at this startup magazine for about a year. And then I got hired there. And that's how I got into magazines. That magazine is called Suede magazine. I remember. Yeah. So this is like the late 90s, early 2000s. This is 2005. That's okay. When I started looking at. So or 2004. Okay. Yeah. And so this is when, yeah, startup was, I want to say an epidemic, like there was startup, 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 startup. There's so much going on in general and business where there was just this blooming of all kinds of companies. And like you said, opportunities. So Suede, there were a few magazines that came out. And so what was the focus of Suede? Was it a beauty startup? Mm -hmm. Suede was a a fashion and beauty magazine. And the difference with this magazine was it was very multicultural. I would say that it was kind of maybe a more modern version of Essence Mm. in that it was more high fashion, edgier, cooler. And I don't mean that as an insult to Essence, but I think that to this day, in terms of Black women, we've never really had the variety that white women have in publications. And this is something that always stood out to me being in the business is, you know, we could have a Vogue, Cosmo, we can have an L, we can have a ladies home journal, you know, we can have shape, we can have all these magazines geared toward white women. And we had one. And I feel like when Suede came out, that inevitable feeling of competition comes up because we're trained to think we can only have one, right? But the reality is we should have five, you know, and I always felt that way. And and there were others, you know, I think maybe there were things like Heart and Soul, if I remember. Yes, Heart and Soul. Yes, I remember. We we did have some others, but you know what I mean? I think that we absolutely needed something else. And so I feel like Suede came to kind of fill this void and one person could read both magazines, you know, but it was really, really exciting, really fun. I would say to this day, it was probably one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. Okay. And. And I had no idea what I was getting into. I just saw an opportunity. Then when I got in there, it was other people who made me realize how cool it was. They're like, I would get to know some beauty publicists. And they're like, first of all, you know, you're working at the hottest magazine out there, right? And then they were like, I realized nobody goes into the business the way that I did. A lot of the women that were beauty editors began as interns in their publication and then became assistants and so on and so forth. Coming from a brand Mm -hmm. in a marketing department further along into my career was very, very different than how most Mm. people go into the business. So again... I'm glad I did it while I could, because after a certain point, you're too far away. You know, you've had too much experience in something else and it wouldn't have worked. And so I think I got in just at the right time before I had too much experience in the brand. Sure. Coming from beauty helped, though. Okay. I was working at a beauty brand going to be a beauty editor. So that still worked. Nice. Nice. So let's talk about being in this $500 billion industry of beauty. And (laughs) yeah, that's the global take. $500 billion. Yeah. Yeah. And so the U.S. actually obviously leads as the, I think, the biggest market for beauty. And then there's China and then there's Japan as far Mm -hmm. as I've read. So with that in mind, and as you approach 
your opportunities now and how you navigate that industry and being able to write what you want to write. Because I mean, I think there's this balance of writing what is demanded of you, particularly as a Black woman, but then also being able to write what you want to write. So tell us more about how you go about approaching projects and how projects come to you. Mm -hmm. Well, more recently, what's been great is that I get these opportunities to write about things related to Black women and Black beauty. And that's like very recent. I would say this began, I I would say really ramped up maybe only three to four years ago. Mm. Um, Seems sad, but that's true. I think. So wait, what do you think has contributed to that? The number one thing that I think has contributed to the shift was in 2017 when Rihanna launched Fenty. I was going to say that. I think that will go down as one of the major turning points in beauty history. You know, Mm -hmm. if I were a beauty historian Mm -hmm. 10 years from now writing about it, I would absolutely devote some chapters to the way that her launch changed so much. And it's not that those concerns weren't there. It's just that the timing, you know, of when she did it and what happened as a result just exploded. And then I would say this year, 2020 has also been an important year in terms of changing beauty. I, you know, like I I didn't see this next level coming, but when Rihanna launched her line, you know, it's so interesting, you know, earlier in my days, when you work in beauty, it's kind of loaded. It's a loaded conversation unintentionally. On the one hand, I think it's a great unifier. Mm -hmm. Um, Any woman can start a friendship with any other woman by starting with beauty. I love your nails. I love your hair. Where do you get your hair braided? What is that lip gloss? These conversations can happen in any public bathroom, like at a restaurant. It's true. At a club, at a bar, and a friendship can be born from beauty. And I've always loved that. I became friends with many colleagues by, and the reason I say bathroom is I, I remember like just in the office, you know, I became friends with some colleagues simply because one day they were like, what can I do about this spot on my face? Because when you're the beauty editor, there's a whole other staff that does a bunch of other stuff. And so the person that covers politics doesn't know about beauty you know, and so they know you're in the beauty team and that you're around all the products. So they start asking you stuff. And then next thing you know, you become friends and you know, all that. So I do love that. I think it can be a unifier, um, especially now in our more global world, we've seen like K beauty become a big thing. Um, I would love to see K beauty, Korean beauty, um, Korean beauty trends. So it can sort of give you now that's a marketing thing, but you know what I mean? I think it can give exposure to other cultures But I think that Rihanna was able to vocalize a lot of the complaints Black women have had for years, which is that our skin tones are ignored in the makeup space and things don't work for us. And brands ignore us. They neglect us. They don't make shades for us or they make bad shades for us. And she showed that it can be done. Launching 40 foundation shades debunked every myth. You know, it debunked all the excuses that brands have been making for years And because of her power and her visibility, she forced the industry to change. And everybody was tripping all over themselves to cater to us for the first time in our lives and making all these shades. And I mean, we've been here, you know, and it's like all she did was prove them wrong even more. So the second they started making all these shades, it just proved that they had the capability all along. Mm -hmm. So she kind of shamed them into it. And competition and potential money and all that pushed them into it. And I think it changed so much. And the conversations that happened, you know, around that time, a lot of people want to weigh in and talk about it. I got to write about it, things like that. And then I think this year, the summer of protesting racial injustice took things to another level too. And I think it's now it's been exposing the behind the scenes in the industry, not just the consumer side, but like what it's like working at these brands, what it's like working in these magazines, the toxic behavior women of color have to endure the microaggressions. Like it's a lot of stuff I never thought would be discussed so publicly that I have experienced my whole career. I just think social media has just really given the power back to consumers and back to the people. We can use it to call brands out that can be good or bad. And it's really been a tool to expose the truth and to push for change. I've been excited when people also reach out to me specifically to write about something related to Africa. Mm -hmm. So last year in May, I wrote a cover story for Allure 
about this incredible Sudanese model named Adut Akech. And I'm obsessed with her. She's just incredible. And one of those people that you meet who you just know she's so special. And I just, she's just amazing. But I got to, you know, spend time with her on the cover shoot. We talked throughout the day. And then we had a call. And when we had our follow up call, at the end of our conversation, she was like, you know, it's been so easy to talk to you. It's been so great talking to you. And I'm so glad that you're the one that's doing this interview. And we had this great moment. And it it kind of reinforced what keeps me going, which is that what she's saying, what she's essentially saying is that she's not always talking to someone she can relate to. And we could connect. I mean, she had a very different life than I have had. You know, she was a refugee and she grew up mostly in Australia after that, after she got out of the refugee camp in Kenya. Now she's a supermodel. But we do relate on so many things. And so I do think that she told me she was that she opened up to me way more than she normally does. And I love having those moments because it just reminds me that that's why I need to stay you know, I'm trying to get out (laughs) and everyone, and that goes for you. That goes for anyone like us, you know, we need to stay. It can be very hard. And sometimes you want to give up. You feel like, what's the point? I don't belong. It's never going to work. And then those moments remind you that it does matter. Like our presence does matter. And so I do enjoy when people specifically reach out to me for stuff like that. And that happened again with Allure for this November cover with another model, Kasiwa Abua. She's your your Ghanaian sister. Yeah. And I think we had a great conversation. We had to talk via Zoom because she's in London and we're all, you know, in a pandemic. But yeah, I think it was the same thing where I feel like our conversation, I could, you know, I have a lot of Ghanaian friends. So I was able to kind of connect with her on that front. And a lot of her mother is British. And so she's kind of straddling two cultures and had to, she, you know, I, I feel like the conversations that come out of it when I'm able to interview people like that are different. And what I would choose to highlight in the story versus what another writer would, I think is very different. Right. Another cool thing about this particular story is that the photographer, whose name is Ruth Osei, she has Nigerian roots. And so they chose this other African woman. I think she's also like based in, in England, but I love that idea of this Brit, African, two African Brits, you know, one is the cover star, one is the photographer, the way that she might choose to shoot that story. And there were other models in this story as well. But Kasiwa was on the cover. I love this direction. And the magazines recognizing it's about behind the scenes too, the talent behind the scenes. And so they deliberately chose Ruth, you know, for this. And I think that's kind of the next evolution is okay, but who are the stylists and who are right. the makeup artists? Right. Who's the creative director? Sure. Not just like, let's trot out these black faces, you know, and check off some boxes. But, sure. you know, there's a lot of artists too behind the scenes. Sure. And sure. then choosing me as a writer, you know? So uh, that feels like a big payoff of kind of still being in this, in this game. In this industry, right? So how do you stay? I mean, so that's a payoff. And obviously there's always the pull to, like you mentioned, like, do I really want to stay? Is it really worth it? That's a great payoff because we are in these places to tell our stories because mm-hmm. when we let others tell our stories. They don't always tell the stories that are resonant with us and for people like us. So do you find that there's this potential to get pigeonholed, that you only get work when it has to be, has something to do with a Black or an African or someone of color? Do you ever find that that's kind of what you're up against at times in the space? Because obviously it is a very white industry generally, you know, as illustrated by the idea that we couldn't even get shades before three years ago. So how do you stay above that and make yourself competitive in the space? Mm -hmm. I definitely think that's a problem for sure. And it's been a problem even before Fenty came out, you know, and I've had a lot of resentment about that a Mm -hmm. lot because I think what needs to happen is we need to be in the decision-making roles. And I, I will be honest, I do resent being used to protect the publication, protect them from criticism, Mm -hmm. perhaps like you know, mm-hmm. protecting them from being accused of not using black writers, protecting them from saying the wrong thing, right? Like there's a protection in, well, if we have her do it, then mm-hmm. we're good because we can't get in trouble for something. I do resent that. And I am very aware that that's what's going on. Now, will I take those checks? Yes. Right. You know, I, I often do, as a lot of us do. But I'm very aware of that. And I just think the answer is that 
we need to be in those leadership roles. Because the other problem is that when you get tapped for these assignments, but ultimately you don't get the big rewards that somebody on staff gets. Mm -hmm. And so again, I just sometimes feel like we are being used. I think all the coverage that Black entrepreneurs and activists, philanthropists, business people are getting right now is fantastic. And I absolutely think we need to use it and harness it, ride that momentum. But I feel sometimes that we're being used, you know, to make these outlets and people look good. And I don't like the idea that someone is patting themselves on the back for this coverage or for making certain hires and stuff when it's really meant, I sometimes feel more for like, oh, here's what we're supposed to do now, right? Like, Mm -hmm. this is what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't think there's a lot of sincere interest or desire to support, desire to right some of the wrongs. There are some great allies in the industry, but we still just don't have the power. And I think it would be so much better if we could have more power. Sure. Um, And I think the power will really ultimately come from us having our own thing and sort of living side by side. One of the great things that I personally feel is the importance of these legacy publications is diminished. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I think they've lost credibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I still love magazines. I always will. But if we can also make them less important, I think that has a lot to do with pushing change. And so when we can celebrate a Black person, an African person, somebody in the diaspora on the cover of a magazine. I think it's still worth celebrating and it's really meaningful, I'm sure, to the person featured. But we can also make it less important, meaning the validation from them can be less important. And I think that gives us more power. I Um, would agree. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and sort of like this kind of seeking credibility through these brands and publications It has been important in the past because it leads to more lucrative work. It leads you down the career path you want. Mm -hmm. But I think that the power comes when we can also shift that dynamic and say, why do they get to decide that? You know, why do they get to decide our worth? And the worth is through them and they're the gatekeepers. And I just would like to see that change more. So I guess that's the the great thing about social media because it becomes this really serious equalizer. If you yeah. can get a million views or a million likes from being yourself as a Black person with your audience, that's as valuable as however many readers might be reading your Cosmo or your Allure or your Marie Claire and validating that brand as opposed to your own brand, which is you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I get it. Yeah, I think the people are driving things, you know, we used to look to magazines to dictate the trends, you yeah. know, the magazines dictate what you should wear, what you should look like, who is important, you know, who's important culturally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think the people are dictating that now. You know, I don't necessarily think the traditional editor in chief wants to put Megan Thee Stallion on the cover of her magazine. Right. Or Cardi B. Right. Or even Lizzo. Exactly. And yeah. But it's in their best interest to do so now. And that's because of the people. Mm-hmm. You know, over the summer, Vanity Fair had three Black women in a row on their cover. I mean, I remember years where they wouldn't have three in a year. Right. And so I was just sitting with that, like, holy crap. I think it was Janelle Monet, mm-hmm. then Viola Davis, and then that beautiful Amy Sherrill painting for, of Breonna Taylor. Mm-hmm. And I, it was the Breonna Taylor issue that made me realize whoa, wait a sec, Vanity Fair got real black this summer. (laughs) Yeah, and so I definitely see those power dynamics shifting, but I'm just curious what's on the other side of this and kind of where we go from there because I still think they're controlling it, not us. Yeah, yeah. But supporting each other, there's a huge push to support Black-owned beauty businesses right now, and I think that's amazing. Another thing that's not you know at the forefront but that I am enjoying is I also am seeing a lot of African beauty founders stepping up and making some things that are inspired by their heritage. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'd love to write about more. I'd love to see that get more visibility. Nice. Nice. So we'll hope to see some. So what are some of the ones that you're watching and seeing that we can share with our listeners? You know, I would say my favorite ones are pretty new and sort of independent. Actually, a friend of mine has a really beautiful line called The Whistling Thorn. 
Mm. Uh, her name is okay. Jackie. Yeah, her name is Jackie Karibu. She's Kenyan. And it started as a skincare line, but she recently launched these beautiful fragrances. One of them is, I think, the Naivisha Rose. And it's a rose that's from Kenya. And her whole idea with it is like when you think of like, rose is such an old note, right, in the fragrance world. And it has this reputation. You associate it so much with, I think, Europe. Yes. And Paris, maybe even, or, you know, things like that. And so she's trying to say, guess what? There's this Kenyan rose that nobody ever talks about. And that's what I'm going to use as my inspiration for my fragrance. That kind of storytelling that can come out of things like that is what I really love. Yeah. Everybody knows about Uoma Beauty created by Sharon Shooter from Nigeria. And she brought that here. Mm -hmm. And it's a line that can sit with any cosmetics line. It's just Mm -hmm. the fact that she's behind it. And I think that's incredible. And she's been a super, super vocal this year about holding other brands in the industry accountable. Mm -hmm. Something that I just learned about last week is this line from a woman named Salwa. She's from Chad. Mm -hmm. And she's making this hair cream out of a Chebe plant. Mm-hmm. Anybody from Chad is listening. I, I'm sorry if that's the wrong <laughs> <laughs> pronunciation, but this is a seed. It's a seed that women in Chad use on their hair. And she is putting it into this hair cream and stuff like that. Like, I'm just like, yes, I think there's going to be a lot more of that. And I think yes. that internet has allowed that, you know, you can start a direct to consumer brand fairly easily. And so people can just start something. And I I just, I'm loving this, you know, this new sort of, there's a lot of women who are making shea butter products and they have been for a long time and really great ones. But I think expanding that, Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when people incorporate their African heritage, I just... I'm like, yeah, it's just not out there as much. Right, right. These are great ones. And, you know, I think people don't know, but Kenya is like one of the largest flower markets in the world. They export flowers to Europe. Well, I mean, I'm not sure how since the pandemic, but they are a Mm -hmm. huge exporter to Europe. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I get it. The rose would be something that's very... Yeah, and I think she was telling me about that. And I know the same is true with herbs. I think herbs is the same thing. But yeah, I mean, and again, when these stories come out, you know, through the products, it's educating a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think opening their eyes to these countries and sort of realizing there's more going on there than what you'd see. Right. And here you don't see much at all. So just open your eyes to a lot. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So question that I also asked some of my guests is thinking about opening your eyes. What is your favorite or an innovative mindset hack that you can imagine or one that you know of? A mindset hack. Mindset hack. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So mindset hack is something that you create as a ritual or something you do all the time that is about creating the best mindset, the best environment for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, I think as a writer, Mm -hmm. you need mindset hacks. I think there's writers who really love it and just comes easy to them. For me, it can be such a struggle. I think especially with everything that's been going on this year, getting into a mental space to write anything. You know, in addition to editorial, I'm also writing for brands. I'm doing copywriting for brands and it can be such a challenge to Mm -hmm. focus. So sometimes I realize it's about starting. And so I have kind of a a hack where I just remind myself, just start, just start, just start. And then once you start, it kind of flows. Yeah. I also allow myself to just free write something terrible to get my hands going and my mind going. Sure. And you know what I mean? And that's part of also getting me to start. Yeah. And this is also counterintuitive, but I also stop. So if I feel stuck and I feel like I'm paralyzed at my computer, I will stop and I will do something else. Because I feel like instead of sitting here for an hour with nothing Mm -hmm. coming out, Mm -hmm. I might as well sort my laundry. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Or I like get, because I think it's productivity, like then I can come back, you know, there's something wrong. Or even if it's taking like a 20 minute walk and then coming back. Yeah. That's sometimes how I get through block. Nice. Nice. Those are good ones, particularly to just start, right? Mm-hmm. And knowing when to just stop. So those are definitely, we beat ourselves up a lot by not deciding to take responsibility or take a choice to get ourselves out of a situation that's not working for us. So yeah, I like those. I like And those. sometimes when you want to do something, 
and you're not doing it, you just start piling. You said, you know, beating up on yourself, mm-hmm. then you start beating up on yourself. Like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I've wasted this morning. I've, you know, and, and it just becomes a spiral. And that's why I think sometimes just then do something like exit and actually complete another task because you'll yes. feel better Yes. than sitting there staring at the clock and you're still, you know, scrolling yeah. Instagram or you're still reading something on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, how do you, when I sometimes write, I find myself sometimes in so many rabbit holes that are just like, oh my gosh, how did I even get there? So how do you manage that aspect of writing in distractions? What are some things that you... I don't manage it. (laughs) (laughs) You too? I I need help managing it. I fantasize about having another computer that has no internet on it because I think it's very hard to have the internet. I mean, we're all working on the computer all day, but I think that when your work is writing and it can be solitary, it's even harder to not open up all these tabs. I don't have an answer for you. (laughs) But the the internet one is a good one because I find that so when I'm in Ghana, sometimes the internet just isn't working. And so I just can't do that. And so, so what I'm forced to do if I have to write something is to just write it and then just take more notes for things that I want to look up later. So that keeps me in the flow of what that is, but then I take I like notes that. to know what I want to do next. So, so yeah, I think you can turn off the Wi-Fi. Ooh, yeah. I think also <laughs> to that point, that's a great tip, but I think also I definitely close my email because sometimes I can deal with not looking at other websites, yes. but seeing email, just even visually having it yeah, there. That, yeah. Open, yeah. So I will often close it. And yeah. just decide for the next two hours, I'm just going to close it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So those are also tips for managing distraction. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. hard. Well, Baze, I am so happy we had this time together, particularly just getting into the world of beauty and just understanding how it is really transforming us and, and how we deal with each other. So do you have, before I get to my last questions. We talked a lot about your work and all those things, but I like to ask a few questions about what you are outside of being a writer or a worker. And so what are you watching these days? Ooh, I love TV. Even before we had nothing else to do, (laughs) I was a big TV fan. Yeah. So I've been a huge fan of Homeland. Homeland. Yeah. Since it came out. And I just decided to go back and watch the last season, which I think came out earlier this year. Maybe it's like a break from real politics and watching a fictional political setting, kind of what I was craving (laughs) post-election and then this time. So I went back and I was watching the last season of Homeland and it's excellent. I've loved the show since the beginning. So I was really... Homeland, it's about like six or seven years old, right? Yeah, I yeah. This was season eight. Season eight, um, okay, so eight years. Came ago. out like ten years ago or so, okay. and I've watched every season. Okay. And so I just went back to watch this final season, and it's just you know it's a spy thriller. It's mm-hmm. there's so much tension in the show, and mm-hmm. there's all of these like unexpected twists and turns, and it's just such a well done, really really smart show. So I'm back in that, and then I'm watching this show on HBO called The Undoing. The Undoing. Okay. Yeah, that's with Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant. Hmm. And, you know, it's, I guess it's also a thriller or drama that takes place in New York. Mm-hmm. And it's about a really wealthy group of people and a, a murder that happens and kind of what goes down. But it, it's just, yeah, it's just a good sort of well written, well acted. Yeah, just an escape. It's a good show. Okay, nice. So as always, our show notes will have that information. Mm -hmm. Listeners will be able to follow up on Homeland and The Undoing. So any last words for our listeners before we go? Last words for listeners. Let's just keep supporting each other through stuff like this podcast and word of mouth and just keeping these conversations going and and really just celebrating ourselves you know, and and helping ourselves, I think is the key to the next phase of our growth. Nice. Nice. I think those are great last words. (laughs) Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. So again, we'll have great show notes with all of Baze's work. 
what she's watching, what she's working on. And as always, listeners, you can find us at localcitizenspod.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you find your podcasts, you can find us there. So until next time, bye for now. Bye.